kutengo mnyaka ka 20, 16, kwa bako umbalo, opalwe endabini ya kukali nyanga. Esinga zange suwazi, saza makukwazi, ulabe ilizwe longe li ngakama, kukubona la mbalo. Otake lo mbalo uba upalwe, nabantu abatibaya kolo wa kodwa. Inkubo zabo, zinga bona kati silonto. It's not that people would live like the seven nations, but it's the dependence they have on their religious leaders that worries us all the time. We found that people are willing to kill for no apparent reason. You are, you are not nice to my pastor, my prophet, my whatever. I'll threaten you with death. Welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you very much for joining me here again today. Firstly, I just want to start off by saying sorry it's so dark in here. We are filming in the day, but it is absolutely pouring down in Cape Town, so it's very cloudy outside. But last week we spoke about the case of Zoliswa Nkonyana and how Zoliswa was just going out with her friends one night, living her life, and how this turned into an absolute horror show and how it absolutely changed their lives forever. But if you haven't seen that video, I'll link it up here for you. But what we're going to talk about today is something I feel we only watch on Netflix or documentary shows that happens in other countries and not necessarily in our country. But even though we talk about crime on this channel, obviously quite a lot, I'm still surprised and shocked about what people can do to each other. But not only do we also talk about crime, we also talk vaguely about the police. And as much as we know things aren't always on par with how police conduct their work and their investigations, some police officers really do try their best in this country and they are faced with lack of infrastructure, lack of money, lack of tools, lack of support. And there's also another question that is, do we actually even really respect our police officers? And if we go further into this case, the answer is not really. Because not only do these police officers try and serve and protect us every day, but they are also shot at and have to fear for their lives every day as well. But with that being said, enough talking about the police and let's get into today's case. Tended for mature audiences only. Today we are heading to Inglobo, which is a town in the Eastern Cape province of South Africa and is apparently a relatively small town with a high population. This town is said to be stunningly beautiful, but sadly with the lack of economic development. The people in Inglobo are said to be very community-based, but sadly the lack of jobs and things to do for the youth or people there, sadly the crime here is also very high. Apparently, back in the day, the town was known for cattle being taken from farmers, things being taken off farms, so it is said to have a very bad rap in terms of crime. However, the people who do live there say it is absolutely beautiful and there is stunning opportunity for this town. However, lack of support and funds from the ruling government makes this very difficult for Ngobo. There were also some reports that the murder rate in Ngobo is almost double the national average, so it is incredibly high in this small town. But we cannot get into this case fully without talking about the seven brothers of Ngobo and the Mangoba Seven Angels Church or Seven Angels Ministry. The Mangoba Seven Angels in the beginning was a very small group they kept to themselves and didn't really push their beliefs and whatever they believed onto other people. The Seven Angels Church didn't even have a place or a church. They would walk around to people's gardens, to public places, they would walk around to fields. If they were allowed to come onto people's property, they would pitch a tent on people's property, preaching to whoever would listen right in the beginning. The seven Mantroba brothers stayed in Ngoba with their mother, who was kind of the matriarchy or hierarchy of this Mantroba Seven Angels Church. But apparently what people started to notice about the Seven Angels Church or the Mantroba Seven Angels, what they noticed was that the children who were attending this church or the ministries 
were not going to school at all. So they would never see their friends who went to this church now at school ever. And the parents also started to notice this as well. So when they were able to speak to the children or speak to the parents of the children, they said that according to the seven angels or the seven Mankloba brothers, that these brothers said that if Jesus never went to church, why should the children? What makes them better than Jesus? So people at the time were like, okay, but your children do need to go to school. They need to learn. But the people who were going to this church just focused completely on what the seven brothers or seven angels were talking about. And they were not interested in anyone else saying these things to them that weren't making sense to them at all anymore. So time went by, years went by, and people started forgetting about the Matloba brothers and also this church. And as the years went by as well, apparently the Seven Angels Church left Entlobo, but then years would pass and then they came back to Entlobo. And when they came back, they apparently bought a piece of property that was at the base of a mountain. And people don't really know how they got hold of this property because they never really knew that it was ever for sale. It was just an abandoned or unused property at the base of this mountain. So when the Seven Angels Ministries came back, they then bought this property apparently, and they then set up shop or home there at this place now. But not only was the Seven Angels Church now back in Ngoba, but also they had a lot more people coming to the church. And not only did they make this place their home, which the people of Ngobo thought that wasn't for sale, but also what the Seven Angels did was on the base of this mountain, they wrote a whole lot in paint. And apparently they also drew a cross in paint as well. I'll put a picture up here of what it looked like. So the people of Ngobo thought that this was absolutely such an eyesore. This beautiful landscape was now had paint all over the side of the mountain when these guys came back. But now the Seven Angels Church was fully back. They had a lot of people in their compound and they were fully practicing and enticing a lot of people in in Kobo as well to come and join the church. So remember we spoke earlier that years before the Seven Angels Church got more popular, the children would notice that their peers were no longer coming to school. But apparently, when you join the Seven Angels Church, not only were the children not allowed to go to school, because remember, Jesus didn't go to school, according to the Seven Mankoba brothers, but apparently, the, all the retired people, all the people who were no longer working, in order to join the church, these older people would have to cash in their entire retirement, so they would have to give every single thing that they owned to the Mankoba brothers. And the reason that they did this and they fully believed that it was okay to do this was that the seven angels or the seven Mankoba brothers said that they would look after them completely. They would live on this compound, they would make their own food, they would be able to breed their own cattle and they would be self-sustainable basically. And these brothers would look after the people who were living on their compound apparently. But if we go back to the eyesore that was now on the side of this mountain, the people of Ngobo would actually report this to the police. They would be upset that the church was making a lot of noise, they were bringing a lot of people in, and also they were ruining the face of the mountain. So they went to police to talk about it, and police would kind of do stuff, they kind of wouldn't do anything about it. So it was really pointless going to the police about the Mankoba brothers, and it seemed like these brothers had the police in their pocket in some instances, but they were also police who worked at the Inkobo station who did try and do things about the ministry but their hands were really tied behind their back because it did really look like the Mankobo brothers had some police or some higher people in their pockets. So to the people of Inkobo the brothers were completely untouchable and this church was just a massive eyesore to them in the community that they couldn't really do anything about. Now, if we have a really quick look at the compound, as you enter the front gate of the compound, there's this main building, which I can't confirm is the main church or if it's where the brothers would stay. But there was a main building right in front of you and to the left, it seemed like they were living quarters as well, which one of these two must have been where the brothers lived and vice versa was the church. But if you look at the back of the property, there was a lot of tin housing or houses that were made out of tin, which would accommodate the people who lived on the compound. And these are where the members of the church would stay in. So what we've gathered so far is that there are seven Mankoba brothers who live in Nkobo and they run a seven angels ministry or church in the area. They are untouchable by police. They are asking their members to give them all the money when they arrive and they are not allowing children to go to school. There were also reports or articles that said that these brothers would be able to produce miracles or to provide miracles to their members 
or outsiders and outsiders were allowed to come to some services. It was very grainy of how they got this to happen. But if you were an outside member, you could come to one of the brothers and ask them to perform a miracle on you, whether that be to get you that job, to help fix a loved one who is really ill, to help heal people. So it was very deep and personal things to the people who were coming here. But if you wanted one of these miracles performed by one of the brothers, you would have to pay a really, really hefty price tag. And as we spoke about earlier, Enkobo is not a very high income area. People here really work incredibly hard for their money and there's not a lot of economic development in this area. So whatever money the people in Enkobo had was theirs and that there was not an influx of this money coming. So if they were wanting to give money away for these miracles, it was very personal and important to them and just kind of expected from the seven month Goba brothers. But I'm talking about massive sums of money that the people would have to give to one of these brothers to perform a miracle. Like like upwards of 20,000 rand, so it's a lot of money. And also it was never confirmed or denied whether these miracles actually did take place or whether people going to ask the brothers for miracles happened to get their miracle come true. Just as a side note. So in order to progress in this case, we've spoken about the church, we've spoken briefly about the Mankoba brothers, but we need to talk about what happened on the 21st of February, 2018. But this all happened just after midnight. So that was just based on what the residents heard. But what happened further up the road was absolutely horrific. Two police officers were patrolling the streets near Nyanga High School in Nkobo, here outside the high school while patrolling. Another van approached with multiple people inside the van. When the assailants first saw the police car, they held out multiple guns outside the windows, pointing at the police. The two police officers inside the van then put their hands up and got out of the vehicle. The assailants then told them to throw their guns on the floor, get on their knees and put their hands behind their heads. The two police officers were then shot at the back of the head, execution style, and left outside Nyanga High School. At least two assailants then got into the police vehicle and drove away with that vehicle. The rest of the assailants then got back into the van that they came in and drove to another area of Nkobo. The two assailants who were in the police vehicle then drove towards the Nkobo police station. They then proceeded to enter the Nkobo police station where they then opened fire on the two police officers who were on duty that night. While the two suspects were inside the police station, they then raided the gun safe and took out at least two pistols, at least two shotguns and multiple boxes of ammunition. When the assailants then finished raiding the police station, they then left the police station via the back door and as they were about to leave, another police vehicle then entered the police station from the gates behind the police station and here the two assailants then opened fire on the two police officers who were in this next vehicle. The police officer who was the driver of this vehicle passed away in the shooting, however the passenger managed to survive later on. There were also reports that when the police officers were first killed by Nyanga High School and when they first entered the police station, the two assailants, and they were starting to raid everything, there apparently was a soldier who was walking past Nkobo police station and he heard the gunshots first. He then came into the police station and then was gunned down by these guys as well. So there were reports that there were five police officers killed and one soldier at the time. So remember I said that the two guys left in the police vehicle and they then headed to this police station, shot all those police officers and the soldier. And I said also that there was another vehicle or the original van that went in another direction into Nkobo. While that van apparently went to an ATM or a group of ATMs where they set into each of these ATMs and they blew up all of them to get the cash out of it and apparently the whole killing of the police officers and all of this murder was to distract the police officers to not interfere with the bombing and the raid of all the cash.
think it was easy for anyone to find mistakes because he's a guy that used to try by all means to live peacefully with other people. <laughs> the first time when he bought a car, I was the one he did to drive. Even my homework, he was the one who was doing them. Actually, he was helping me to do them. If he play a song, he asks the name of the artist, and then he promises, if you, you get it right, I will give you a two rand, you see. My father was like a friend to me. He was like my big brother. Because always, if I have a problem, I talk to him, and then he gives me nice advice. Now, watching that video, we can say as much as we want about the police and how much they do or they don't do, how much happens behind the scenes that we don't see. And we do need to remember that the police officers and the soldier who came to rescue or were just doing their job is someone's father, brother, loved one, friend and husband. And all they were doing was working and serving and protecting us. Now, killing of any police officer in any country is a major offense and taken quite personally by other police officers, obviously, because they are taking one of their own and they are killing their friends. So the police of South Africa were now coming for blood. They were not impressed about how many police officers were gunned down in cold blood that night. And the police worked really hard. And apparently they also received a tip off that the people who gunned down the police and also the people who blew up the ATMs all drove speedily towards the Mantoba Seven Angels Church that night. So the police who are working on this case, 65 hours after they started the investigation, after all of these police and soldiers were murdered, they were then armed and guns blazing and headed towards the Matkoba Seven Angels Church. But the police knew that these guys were obviously armed and dangerous and they weren't going to go down without a fight because they apparently just killed five brothers in blue and also another soldier. So the police knew that they had to come prepare. And when they were all waiting outside the Mantroba Seven Angels Church, they were in full riot gear. They had helmets, they had bulletproof vests on, they had riot shields. They were ready for a fight. And apparently when they were outside of this compound and the people inside the church knew that the police were here to apparently do something, it took 30 minutes for the gunfire to stop. And in this 30 minutes of back and forth shooting between the cops and the people in the church, three out of the seven Mantoba brothers passed away in the shooting, as well as two other members of the church. So five people passed away that day. And like I said, three of the Mantoba brothers. So when police had now determined, okay, no one else is shooting, everyone has given up and they were now cracking down on this compound when they were in there and raiding everything and told everyone to leave it is done now you cannot be here anymore the people who were living on the compound were really really upset that they had to leave the people who lived here really believed in the seven Matkoba brothers and they believed that this church was helping them they were self-sustainable and they just felt that this was the place that they wanted to be and also they had such strong beliefs in the seven brothers that when the police were taking them off the compound that the cops were now ruining their beliefs and taking their beliefs away from them basically And police removed over a hundred people from the compound that day, and many of them were children who had children of their own. So now that the police have raided, we're going to have a look at the compound itself. And when the police went into the compound, the members who stayed in the tin housing at the back, there were so many mattresses on the floor that you couldn't even walk. It was completely chock-a-block full. They pushed about 20 people to share mattresses in a one-bedroom piece of this tin house. The people inside the church or inside the compound were also never allowed to leave. If they left the compound, it was believed to be an absolute sin. And the Seven Mantoba brothers would be very upset with them and if they left they would lose their ability to come back onto the compound and obviously all the money that they have given the brothers but apparently this place this compound was not only a place of pure religion according to the seven angels or the seven brothers but the seven brothers believed that the children who lived on this compound were theirs and that they could do whatever they wanted to them 
And I'm talking about children at least 12 years old. And what these brothers would do is that they would feel that they could be with them anytime they wanted, sleep with them anytime they wanted. And of course, this resulted in children of their own. One of the children was actually apparently married to one of the Matroba brothers. And she was only 15 years old at the time when she was married to one of the brothers. And she had two children by one of the brothers. So according to the brothers, the reason that they started this church in the first place was that they were on a crusade to stop Lucifer and to protect the world of Lucifer and what he was going to do to people. And they felt that they were the only people who were able to do this. And by taking people into their church and helping them to grow, apparently this is what the brothers believed that they were doing. And this is why they were there in the first place. But not only did the police notice the tin housing for the members, the copious amount of children inside this compound, but also the high amount of luxury cars, millions of rands inside the compound. There was just so much wealth in this compound. And apparently, if you wanted to be a member, not only did the elders of this community have to give their entire pension, but also if you wanted to be a member and you were younger, you had to hand over everything you owned, your cars, your housing, your wealth, everything. Everything had to go to these brothers. As a side note, in 2016, the police actually did do a raid on the compound and they removed 20 children from the compound itself and took them into protective custody because they felt that this was an unsafe environment for them. The police kind of just gave a warning and said, listen, this shouldn't happen again. And they just left it and thought that maybe it'll just go away on its own. It'll just fizzle out. But while police were doing the raid, because this was a religious community, they had to bring someone from the council who works with minority religious groups. And this person who was from the minority religious group, they wrote a very lengthy document about the whole compound and how they believed that the Seven Mantroba brothers were going to cause absolute chaos, especially when they were running out of money. They said that they were going to do some very bad things and that they were going to do bad things to the children as well. And they wrote this letter and sent it to Parliament, but Parliament didn't do anything about it. And clearly look what happened. But it was believed that not only because of the ATM bombing that the police were targeted in Nkobo, but also because some of the police officers were constant thorns in the brothers' sides and they were constantly going to check and constantly going to see what was happening. But these police officers' hands were tied. They weren't able to do much more than just poke around and be a nuisance to the church. But apparently, according to the brothers, any agents, any law enforcement people, any people in general who stood in the way of their goal of destroying Lucifer was to be completely annihilated and taken out apparently. But I don't think that the Seven Mantroba brothers thought that the police were standing in their way of them destroying Lucifer. I think that the police officers were standing in their way of money and weapons. But back to the arrest. So at least two of the Mantroba brothers were arrested that day. Remember, there were seven of them and only two of them were arrested. Three of them passed away in the shooting. But these two brothers were arrested on the basis of rape sexual assault, assault, and possession of unlicensed and illegal firearms. But even though they were charged with these crimes and police could prove these crimes, they have never been charged of the crimes yet based on the murder of the police officers and the one soldier. And when these two brothers were questioned about the murders of the police officers, they conveniently blamed it on the three brothers who were shot dead in the shootout with police. But even to this day, the trial is still going on. And essentially, the four brothers who were left and who have now left the compound basically have got off scot-free. Forty women and children were questioned. All of these women said that they were basically property of the brothers and can be used whenever and however the brothers wanted to use them, also included the children. Nothing was off limits to these brothers, apparently. And also, the children born into the compound were never registered with home affairs and never given ID numbers. The Mantroba church has been demolished since, and the surviving brothers are still in the legal system, but not facing any direct charges to the murders of the police officers and the one soldier murdered that night. The reason for this trial also taking so long is that the brothers and also the other people who were arrested at the compound said that the police officers who first arrested them completely beat them, tried to touch them inappropriately, 
made them drink their own urine, beat them to a point of almost blacking out and then bringing them back to consciousness, beating them again. And also this has also delayed the trial quite a lot. And the brothers also said that they were forced into a confession. And now the court believes that if the police officers actually did beat the brothers while they were in custody, that these confessions do not count. They are illegal. It's just a cat and mouse chase now between the court and these brothers and the other people who were arrested. So in 2013, the families of the men who were murdered are still waiting for justice. And I think, sadly, it'll be a long road to get that justice. <laughs> But let me know what you think of this case down below. I hope you all have a fantastic weekend further. Please stay safe out there. Have a great week and I'll see you again next week. Thank you. Bye.